Oh, you came in at a good time. Excellent. This is Brian uh, and Mr. Betcher and Ms. Berlin for breaking down security. Hello. What up? Okay. There. Wow. I thought we'd lost <laughs> him again. He's he's using you know Elon's new satellite internet and it's a little slow. So um, it's beta. Yeah, yeah, Uber beta, almost alpha. So I'm gonna shut my window here because uh, you just got the dog barking on the way in here. Uh, fill out your bingo cards accordingly. Uh, so, Ms. Berlin, how uh, how are you doing? Good. Yeah. Tired. Circle yeah. City Con. Yeah. Yeah. How was that? Yeah. It was pretty good. No, uh, what did you think about the speakers? I only went to one talk, so. <laughs> Uh, but I had a, I had some very good conversation outside of that, which made me happier. Okay, uh, I, I I got to talk about a bunch of stuff I was doing at work and kind of collaborate on uh, what other people were doing and how that we might help each other. Nice. Okay. All right. Kind of neat. Um, mm-hmm. You weren't doing the the village, the mental health village. There, you were just as a guest. I did not. Yeah. Like yeah. A- I just went as a guest. I'm doing it. Um, Let's see here. I leave Wednesday to go to Layer 8 in Rhode Island. Oh, my. Okay. Oh, and that's right. You're going to be on the Security Weekly show on Thursday. So I know. If you're a BreakSec listener, uh, go and go and check out Security Weekly. Uh, at least this episode, you know, you can... You know, skip yeah, you all the others. Any other ones. Yeah, this is this is a quality <laughs> episode here, so you want to catch that. Um, yeah, so um, I'm trying to get her to wear a break sec T-shirt, but uh, Ms. Ms. Megan says it is probably more apropos for you to wear a hacker's mental health shirt. So probably that's why I'm going on, and <sighs> and the fact that my break sec shirt now is two sizes too big. So I. Uh, it's not I, too late. You could buy one and get it shipped. You can also get one with your own face on it. You should try that. I yeah. am good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I will let other people wear my face. I, I don't need two of them. Okay. <laughs> All right. Mr. Betcher, that was the dulcet tones of Mr. Betcher you heard. Uh, how are you doing this week, sir? Doing good. Yeah. Same old, same old. Okay. You know. Keeping people safe against all the things. Fighting the good fight. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Speaking of fighting the good fight, we're going to bring our guest in because uh, this is a really great uh, gr- a great uh, interview, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, this gentleman, we were trying to get him on the show at DerbyCon 6. I saw him at a booth in the, not vendor area, but like the uh, the really cool place where all the Lockpick Village and stuff was when the DerbyCon was still at the Hyatt. Um, you know, saw him, introduced ourselves. I was really like, oh my God, it's, you know, you know this this gentleman uh, does a lot of great work. Uh, has a has a, a nonprofit called the Rural Technology Fund, which we'll talk about uh, uh, if not this week on next week's show. And uh, does a he's a, an author, uh, another author on the show here. So Miss Berlin is in uh, rarefied air here with uh, our, our guest this week, uh, and also does uh, does classes on uh, threat hunting, which we'll also talk about probably next week. So uh, Chris Sanders, welcome to the show. Hey, how y'all doing? Right on. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on. It's a really, really long time in coming. Um, but uh, so for those people, the rest of the world who don't know who you are, uh, uh, maybe you could tell a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you're you're at right now. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big question. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Uh, you know, I got my start in information security kind of out of IT. Uh, I grew up in a really rural area and my first job was really being the IT guy for my local school district. Got into intrusion detection. I made the, what I'll say now was a, a mistake in running a, a super early version of Snort on a public school network where IDS had never been run before. Oh Saw a lot of things that I couldn't unsee, uh, but I was then hooked on packet analysis, intrusion detection, uh, kind of built a career out of that, wrote some books along the way. Uh, I worked for a few places. Uh, I worked for Mandiant for a while, a firm called Guardians. spent several years with the Department of Defense, uh, always in an educational role in some way or another. Uh, so I decided a few years ago just to devote basically my life to, to that, educating people, figuring out how to do that better, particularly in our field where we somewhat struggle to do that in a structured, organized way. So uh, I started a company called Applied Network Defense, where we focus on training, mostly online training. Uh, we do some on-site stuff, too, but mostly online. And uh, and that's what I'm doing now, along with the, the Rural Technology Fund. 
Awesome. Okay. Um, so the, the reason we had you on, other than being an author of a fantastic book and doing some uh, excellent work with rural technology, you know, the Rural Technology Fund, which hits kind of close to home for me because I grew up in a rural area. I did not have technology. My first computer, I think, was in high school, and we didn't have internet at the time, so we were playing like you know old school, you know Jeopardy and stuff, and on dial up and or worse. So I, I appreciate the work that you're trying to do there with uh, the Rural Thank Technology you. Fund, and we'll definitely talk more about that at the end of the show. Uh, the reason we had you on was uh, a fantastic blog article called uh, it's titled "Infosec Mental Models," uh, and let me oh man, I uh, oh no, there it is. I had another link open so this is on his site chrissanders.org you can go then and check that out uh dated 29 may 2019 information security mental models so what was the what was the genesis of this um uh blog post what made you want to to write this post yeah sure so this isn't necessarily something that i just kind of came up with here i've actually been focused on education for like i said for a while now not just the act of just teaching and and you know teaching packets or teaching hunting or these things but really studying what makes people learn how we learn how to deliver appropriate pedagogy that's like socially relevant and tie all these big teaching concepts together so mental models are kind of at the core of that for a number of reasons i structure most of my classes around the concept of mental models, uh, teaching people how to think about things using simpler representations of more complexity. And so really why I wrote this blog post was honestly just because I teach enough about this and I talk about mental models enough. I really just needed a reference out there that I could point people to if they wanted to learn more, just needed a simplified explanation of what a mental model is, why it's important kind of at the micro scale for individual use cases and at the macro scale for our industry. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Chris, you start out by saying, hey, this is this is very important because we're in a cognitive crisis right now. Right. And you, and you list three reasons uh, or I guess um, you, you list three. Um, uh, what do you call it? topics or whatnot? Why we are in or examples why to justify why we're in one symptoms. Uh, right. OK, so. You say that the demand for expertise greatly outweighs supply. Now, could that be um, that since capitalism is pretty cutthroat, um, a lot of these startups, many companies don't have the cycles to hire somebody who's not an expert and train them to be an expert? I mean, they need an expert now, right? Otherwise, their competition is going to just eat them for lunch. No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of talk about a skills shortage. And that's to some degree the case. And if you go into, let's say, a shop that's doing, you know, 24 by 7 monitoring, they've got all these alerts they can't handle. They're trying to manage all this different technology. Um, They're spending way too much money probably on product. Um, so they can't devote enough to the people. The salaries for the people are kind of inflated. Um, you know, for all of us, that's probably a good thing, but realistically for the betterment of the world, that's a bad thing. So they can't just devote as much time as they need to, to training people, right? That's what you're getting at. And that's certainly, I think not necessarily a cause. I think it's a symptom of a broader cognitive crisis. This notion that we are not good at teaching people how to be a part of this field. And to some degree, that's evidenced by the fact that most of us, if you ask us how we got into this field, where a lot of us are self-taught, right? We figured it out on our own. Um, And I say on our own, nobody truly does it on our own. We have people we look up to, people we learn from, people who helped us out along the way. But most of us didn't come to this in a structured way. It's not like if I want to be an accountant, I go to accounting school, I get a two or four year degree and I come out and I'm an accountant who knows how to do the job. Uh, It doesn't work that way for us. And that's a problem. And I think that is one of the problems that leads to the symptom of the expertise, uh, the demand for expertise greatly outweighing the supply. Mm. But that's uh, true in most fields, right? What makes us different? Well, I would say it's not true in most fields. Um, Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say it is. I mean, uh, several of the ones I mentioned, like accounting, uh, medicine, I think a lot of people think that there's like this massive, massive demand in medicine. And it's not 
actually the case. Like you can get a job, like it's not a place where there's where they're overfilled with jobs in medicine. Uh, but in most places, uh, other than you know extreme rural communities, uh, it, there's not as nearly as much of a demand as you might think, and the salaries have normalized a lot. Most people think doctors make a ton of money, and sure, the specialties do. But there are tons of information security practitioners I know who are making more than family medicine doctors all over the country. Sure. And wow. you hear about that, like, uh, you know, in college where the, the, the football coach is making several million dollars and, you know, English and, you know, the science, t- you know, professors are, are making a fraction of that. Yeah, the, the free, I mean, the free market economy is really good at dictating how in need your job is by how much they are paying you. Right. So so that's like I said. I think all of us would say, yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, information security, you can make a lot of money doing it. But I would say that until salaries go down a little bit and regulate more compared to some other fields, it's probably also a sign that um, we're not producing the right kind of skills and the right kind of people. And I want to be clear on this. I don't think it's a matter of us not having enough people in the jobs. I think it is in many ways not having the right amount of skill or the right focus in those people who are already on the jobs. It's a little bit of both. Okay, so number the second sign that you mentioned, um, most information cannot be trusted or validated. Um, isn't there plenty of information that can be shared online? I mean, there there's a lot of documentation on vulnerabilities. Um, you've got the the <clears throat> what do you call it? The threat modeling. You also have um, a lot of uh, you know, the new threat hunting stuff mm-hmm. online. So isn't that a great resource for information? And can't that be, I mean, obviously you have to know about it first. But well, that- the issue isn't that there's not enough information. Uh, the issue is that it's poorly organized and you don't know what to trust. Um, for instance, let me give you an example. If I heard was a new investigator and I just heard about shim cash, Right, we know a little bit about Shimcast. It's a way to prove yep. programs executed on systems, and I heard about this. Well, okay, I want to learn about that, so I go Google it. And now Shimcast is a is a byproduct of, of Microsoft feature, right? The application compatibility cache. There are some registry keys and so on. So in a in a, I think a perfect world, I Google that. One of the first couple of results is a Microsoft link where they've got detailed documentation about how it works. It's from the source. It covers all the things you wanted to cover. That's not what we have. Instead, we have a blog post, right? Matter of fact, I just Googled it while we were talking. The top, like the entire first page is nothing but various blog posts and GitHub repos. Um, The very first one is the FireEye blog post where they just kind of discovered and talked about it. And it's a great blog post, but it's certainly not thorough. It's at this point five or six years old. And it's not authoritative, right? It's these folks doing experimentation, learning this on their own. And you can learn a lot from it, but there's a lot of gaps, Right. And there's no there's no need for those gaps to exist. There are folks at Microsoft who developed the Microsoft application compatibility cache. They can, you know, they have the ability to document this really well, really well, but they haven't. Not only that, if you Google, if you do some Google foo and search for the domain Microsoft.com and put in Shimcache, you really won't find hardly any results because Microsoft doesn't refer to it as Shimcache. That is what FireEye referred to it as. Therefore, that is what all of us as practitioners refer to it as. So we're not even speaking the same language, right? Mm. Um, and so that isn't necessarily speaking to models, but it is speaking to this idea that, it, you know, here's a very core part of our job. Shimcast is used across lots of forensic investigations. Yet the information I'm getting on it is third party. It's a little bit dated if I'm just looking at this first page of my Google results, and I just don't have a great authoritative source. All right. So and, wh- and your third sign, uh, large systemic issues persist with no ability to tackle them in large, mobilized, or strategic manner. Isn't that just executives aren't willing to spend the, the money to hire security people because they don't have to? It's, it's largely an expense on uh, a, a risk, right? We may get hacked, but then again, we may not, right? And I'm looking at the our bottom line. Um, I mean, we spend a lot of money on security already. Uh, you know, see the aforementioned I talked about about salaries, uh, the amount of products you have to have. I was talking to a friend of mine who works at uh, a large financial institution recently, and I, I asked him, you know, or he came to me and he's like, he just came into the job and he was like, you know, I counted every security product we spend money on. And this was a company of about five or 600 employees, and they spent money on like 70 different security 
app with security tools that were exclusively for the purpose of security. Some were hardware, some were software. So we're spending a ton of money. It costs exponentially more to defend something than it does to attack something for most use cases, not all, but most. So I don't think it's a matter of, of spending. I don't think people are making conscious decisions that they're not going to tackle these issues. Uh, I just think they can't, right? Like, I mean, right now, look at ransomware. Uh, ransomware is becoming, it's growing at a tremendous rate. It shows no signs of slowing down. And it's a relatively newish thing with kind of the advent of cryptocurrency and, and money that's harder to track. But then look at things like, you know, it, it, devices that have SMB exposed to the internet. We just had this big RDP uh, bug come out. Devices with RDP exposed. That is kind of a big systemic issue, yet you know nobody's really doing anything about it and it's not that people necessarily haven't tried um, even those who have tried like the federal level things with like us cert and so on uh somewhat coordinated efforts they just don't have the capability of doing it right in my experience chris uh when we uh investigate a company or uh what do you call it do a um, um assessment Correct. It's been a long day. Sorry. All right. <laughs> when we do an assessment uh, on a company and they have these fancy tools and they're spending a lot of money on security, it's not because they um, they know that they have to in order not to get breached. It's because they have had several or large security incidents in the past and that has caused them to buy these products so that it doesn't happen again. It's not that they're being proactive, they're being reactive. Uh, yeah, I'm, cert- I'm sure that's true in some cases. I wouldn't say that's everybody, but yeah, I mean, I've been in companies the same deal where they've gotten hacked into and they weren't prepared. And uh, all of a sudden, they uh, whether it's they, they bring in the right people or all of a sudden they have budget to spend now, then they, um, then they shift to becoming more proactive at that point. Right. Cool. So um, you said, uh, you know, the what we need is to have a cognitive revolution. Is that you use the, the tools, uh, cognitive crisis and cognitive revolution. Are those specific terms that, uh, that you learn somewhere or are you just making up your own lexicon? Uh, I mean, they're my words. Okay. Uh, you know, but one of the things I think's really important and we don't do enough of this in this field is to kind of get outside of our own bubble and look at other fields full of smart people because i think we like to think we're the only ones in the room sometimes but we are just merely a part of a much broader world and many of the problems we have uh, to some degree are experienced in other fields now we have unique things that we have to deal with but for the most part when it comes to teaching and learning we're not really in, in super uncharted territory uh the, the example i will use a lot of the time is medicine um, medicine right now, a lot of people think medicine is a big dumpster fire. Insurance is a big dumpster fire. Medicine and evidence-based medical research has never been in a better place. Uh, we've got all these new findings. We're going back and revisiting old findings and learning all this cool stuff. Um, medicine's doing really good if you take out the financial side of it. That wasn't the case 100 years ago, right? Really, like in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, you know, if we look at those three markers I talked about, uh, expertise outweighing supply well you didn't have a doctor if you lived in a small town like brian like the town you grew up in they probably Mm -hmm. didn't have a doctor you probably had to go uh to one a couple towns away i know that was the case in my town not only that when you found the doctor he was also probably your vet uh your mortician and the guy who delivered the ice every tuesday right Mm -hmm. they were doing a lot of things uh you know the whole thing about information not being able to be trusted or validated uh, up until as recently as the 80s, people believed that if you had a stomach ulcer, you should drink milk to fix it. And that was because it was based upon really old, crappy research that nobody ever went and reinvestigated. So they finally did that, and they found out, oh, wait, that is probably the worst thing you can do for a stomach ulcer. It's going to make it worse. Uh, and then this whole thing about large systemic issues. Well, pick your plague or your outbreak of choice. Right? It wasn't until things got more organized that they were able to deal with that. So all those three markers that I mentioned are there amongst these other fields at various times. And what they did was have this really deep period of introspection. They organized. They basically got the right people in the right room. They developed some structure. Some of them developed licensing and certification things that were not just uh, optional, but required to practice their profession in a legal way. And not that that's the answer for us, but that was for them. And they had this metacognitive revolution, so to speak, where they were thinking about thinking. They developed their processes for doctors. That meant medical school and residency, which a lot of folks think is too long. But it actually produces really great skilled candidates who do a pretty good job. Again, medicine's in a great state. So 
all these things are derived from looking at other fields. Medicine is one of them. Law is another. I, I mentioned accounting a lot, and that sounds kind of boring, but accounting is one of those fields where if you go to college for accounting, you graduate and you can drop in and do the job pretty darn effectively. Uh, they're really good at training people for the job. So we have a lot to learn from all of these other fields. Do you think a uh, security field has um, in its future something like that? I would hope something like that. I mean, I, you know, we don't need medical school. As a matter of fact, I think for us, our cognitive revolution, it probably manifests more at the community college level than the university level. I think that's the best place for this to happen just because community colleges are a lot more flexible. Uh, you don't necessarily need a four-year degree to four-year degree to do what many of us do in certain areas of this, and some you do, but not in others. Um, and I just think community college is the place where that's right to happen. Uh, I don't necessarily know if we are going to have some type of super formalized um, you know, certification or accreditation type thing that individuals will have to do. Um, I think that's a discussion worth having, though. So I think we will get there. Will it be in my lifetime? I hope so. I, I, we already have a certification. I, I have my CIS piece. I'm certified. I can, I'm a security person, <laughs> I, I, whatever. I, I, do you feel like we're maybe in the bloodletting uh, era of InfoSec? <laughs> wow, Dra yeah. draining the humors we're and using, using leeches. Yeah, we're using we're using leeches and like yeah. mummy dusted bone. Yeah, not no, mummy dust to, to machine learning. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Right. All that all that magic stuff that happens in your body uh, is now. Well, I mean, and, and really, there's something to that. There's this notion of we have all that we have all these black boxes that supposedly do these magic things, and nobody will tell you what they will do. Well, again, look at medicine 100 years ago. Uh, a snake oil, right? Like that's the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like take this stuff; it'll make you feel better. Um, of course, some of that stuff's coming back. You never know with the, with like the essential oils and all this crazy stuff. And uh, <laughs> I, I have to highly recommend. Uh, there's another podcast, and then they have a book too called Sawbones. It goes into all the medical stuff, and it's super cool. <laughs> well, it, it's amazing. I mean, like, so it's about yeah. I, I was gonna say, like, if I were to ask you right now, what is the perfect normal temperature for a human body? You would probably say ninety-eight point six degrees. Ninety-eight point six degrees. Well, it turns out that is from a study, and I think it was done in like the '30s, where one guy went around and he took like a bunch of people's temperatures using this broke old thermometer that was actually supposed to go in people's backsides. He didn't want to do that like 500 times, so he did it did it via the armpit. Much less accurate. It turns out 98.6 is like 0.5 degrees higher than the actual true average temperature. Hmm. But even then, average temperature doesn't really matter to the single degree because it varies like a whole degree or a degree and a half throughout the course of the day, depending on these various things. We didn't actually know any of this till like 20 years ago. Nice. Yeah. I, found that, I found that kind of amazing. Huh. So we, you know, you were talking about when accountants graduate from college, they automatically, you know, find themselves hireable or in a hiring uh, event and they have all the, the tools necessary to do, uh, you know, accounting. Uh, you know, learning Excel and whatever. I apologize. That's, that's not necessarily the case, but, um, send me your hate account send me your hate. Uh, when people graduate from college with a cybersecurity degree, you can't just walk up into, you know, the, you know, the, the Leviathans and the guardians of the world and go, look, I've got a degree. I'm fancy. Now I can do all the things. Um, you have to gain experience. So there's an additional facet to that, right? It's almost like being in medical school where you have to be an intern. You have to, you know, take your lumps and then move up to that unless you, you know, you're creating malware on the side and you spend a little stint in jail and get your, you know, your street cred. Um, how we, we've talked about this with uh, other folks, uh, Pro Professor Miller from uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney. We've had him on talking about how this can be help with remedy, uh, you know, remedy these kinds of things. Um, you know, in your in your blog post, you mentioned that uh, how do we solve these things? We, he says we must thor thoroughly understand the processes used to draw conclusions, develop experts which I'm going to come back to on the experts bit, must develop some repeatable, teachable methods and techniques, which I'm assuming is, you know, smart based. And educators must build and act, advocate pedagogy that uh, teaches practitioners how to think. So critical thinking skills. Um, we have enough trouble in InfoSec just defining what an expert is. Or being called an expert is 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 a term of denigration for some, or you know, thought leaders or whatever, you know, rocket rock stars and stuff. Um, who are the experts in infosec, in your opinion? And how do we define well, them? 
You know, and that's a key question. And that's part of this thing. To be successful in any of these things, you have to be able to define expertise. And that's a broad question I don't fully have the answer to, right? Like, how do you take one person versus another person decide who's an expert? Now, in my area that I focus on, which is, you know, network security monitoring, I think I can do that pretty effectively in a structured way. But it's, it's not easy, right? It's not easy to measure like aptitude for specific things and skills that go beyond tools, right? I don't want an analyst who's just good at using ArcSight. I want an analyst who's good at investigating and can use any tool that you put in front of them, right? And that's, that's what we mean when teaching people how to think about things. It's understanding the process and when and why they need to use the tools and not just the tool itself. We've been such a tool-centric industry for so long. And that's, that's part of the problem with the colleges too, right? Is, is a lot of these universities, they think, okay, I want to teach someone about intrusion detection. So I'm going to teach them how to use Snort. And voila, they know how to use intrusion detection. Couldn't right. be further from the truth, right? You have to teach them how to think about it, the different concepts, the different mental models that let them map the things they're learning to simplify its structure. Um, good instructors can do this, but, uh, and I'm kind of div- going off on a tangent a little bit. The, biggest problem plaguing universities today is most of them said, okay, we want to teach people cybersecurity. We will have our computer science faculty do that. Um, and these are, and these are folks who, you know, a lot of folks will say, well, they've never been in industry. That's not the case. Most of them have been in industry. They've just been developers um, and, and, you know, engineers. And, you know, whereas, you know, cybersecurity is kind of a, it's cybersecurity is more of a cousin to computer science than it is a child of it, I think. So you can't approach it in the same way. And you don't just need practitioners. You need practitioners who think more broadly than themselves and the task at hand. Uh, so that's that's a little bit of a tangent. Kind of going back to your main question about expertise. I think it's a good question. I don't have the answer fully on that. Um, I think it's going to be very topical. Uh, you know, what it means to be an expert in network security monitoring is different than what it means to be an expert in malware analysis. I think you get the right people in the room. You can come up with frameworks for that. Hmm. Uh, there, there are places that do a really good job of hiring these folks. Um, I'll brag on FireEye. Their malware analysis team, I think, is probably the best in the world. And they are, Mike Sikorsky and those folks are really, really good at hiring folks with the right skills for that job. Now, they have job recs for that open constantly because there are just not enough people with the skills they need. But they've really cracked the code on that. Uh, you know, They're not sharing that, of course, because it is not they don't want people using their same methods and, and snatching up the good folks. Right. And that's again, capitalism at work, but eventually those folks will matriculate out of fire. Eye. They'll move elsewhere. They'll share those thoughts. You get the right people in the right room. One of them decides to go into teaching one day, they publish a paper on it. Everyone else adopts it. And now we've got a methodology for doing this. So it's kind of a long haul, but that's what the road probably looks like. Right. <clears throat> All right. So uh, one of the sections here we're talking about is uh, mental models. And you say we use them all the time. Um, You know, I've argued the point that we're always doing threat assessment. We just don't call it that. You know, it's like, well, if I drive in the snow and I don't have snow tires, then I stand a better chance of spinning out or crashing. If I decide I want to speed, then, you know, the threats are that I'm not going to be able to stop in time and I'm going to, you know, possibly hurt myself or others, Uh, you know, uh, accepting those risks risk management, that kind of thing. Uh, you mentioned three specific uh, mental models. Are, are these mental models or things that, like I mentioned, where we're just constantly thinking about it and, and, and implementing it? Or are these uh, things that, you know, uh, we're using all, all the time? How, uh, what What is a mental model for you in your definition? Sure. So if you, you think about every person has their own discrete lens that they see the world through. And that lens is constantly evolving. It's made up of every experience we ever had. It's to some degree defined by genetics, but also a lot of learned experiences. And ultimately, when humans learn, we take existing knowledge we already have and we connect new knowledge to it. Now, when we talk about things verbally, that's often with like analogy, right? So I'll tell you about something and you'll be like, oh, like this other thing. Uh, and that's how we connect that together. And we have all these like all this physiological magic happening where like neural pathways connect to each other and strengthen and all that. And that's pretty boring. But it's all about connecting the new um, to the old. And mental models are kind of the thing that allows to do that. So whenever I learn a new mental model, a new way of thinking about something, my lens that I'm seeing with gets basically another layer to it. Another thing that my view is filtering through. And it's key to note that these mental models are not 
they're not something we use kind of one at a time. I don't see the world through this mental model, then this one, then this other one, then this other one. They all combine together. Some of them complement each other. Some of them pull at each other and they create kind of uh, uh, these choices or these compromises we have to make. And that can actually lead to like uh, like stress, like real stress and stress-related conditions and so on like that, uh, kind of coming from, from a cognitive side of things. Uh, so these are things that we're always using. We don't always realize we're using them. Uh, but we learn them and it's kind of like learning to drive. Uh, you're very thoughtful. The first time you learn to drive, you're very careful about holding the wheel, checking 10 and two shifting, all that stuff. But eventually you get good enough at it. that You can drive without even thinking about it. Kind of the same with a mental model. You really think about it until it eventually becomes second nature. Cool. Okay. So, um, one of the things that you mentioned in here is called operant conditioning, uh, where the nature of response dictates how likely animals are to uh, exhibit a stimulus. Um, I was actually reading a story just recently about how, uh, for years, uh, they use certain, uh, sexes of animals so the mice are all male and you know because there was some you know it was apparently like the most stable control group uh, using male mice versus male and female mice and somebody actually went back and kind of did a meta am i allowed to make a joke there or no please <laughs> please make a joke <laughs> Please. <laughs> I mean, it's the same in InfoSec. <laughs> oh, yeah. But the, the, the way it was understood was that um, it actually is not as stable as previously thought. And um, uh, so, you know, they... Uh, uh, anyway, they, they, they found out that this, this meta-research to that, you know, male and female mice, when doing tests on them, you know, come up with a lot of the same issue, uh, same issues. It doesn't matter uh, the the sex. So um, your operant conditioning is like a cause and effect kind of thing looks like. So it's like if you get sick every time you eat pineapple, you're not going to eat very uh, pineapple very often. Uh, how does that how does how does how can we use that in in InfoSec or how do, how do we use that uh, in our in our mental models? So opera conditioning is an interesting one because it's kind of at the core of almost everything we do. And it's kind of ingrained into us. Like we all learned it pretty early and we don't necessarily think about it, but it's just simple stimulus and response, right? If, if you do something enough times and, and you get a bad response, you're probably not going to do that thing anymore. Right. So that, that's all we're talking about there. You know, if I, if I've tried to, um, you know, if I, I investigate this alert every time and it's a false positive, eventually I'm going to realize it's always a false positive and never look at it again. Of course, therein lies the problem because you can see where that could create a trap that you would fall into. The one time it is not a false positive and you miss it, uh, bad things happen. So um, it's kind of a it's kind of a broad. I chose that one just because the concept I think most folks are familiar with um, the way conditioning generally works. So I just chose that as an option uh, of a of a mental model, they, they can be simple and complex. Like that's a fairly simple one. I talked about distribution and the bell curve. That's a mathematical model, which is de facto kind of a mental model. And I talked about the scientific method, which are all, I think things most people have a basic understanding of, but mental models can be super complex too. So, you know, one of those to think about uh, the two big ones are probably your religion and your system of government that you live in. Those give you mental models, really complex, deeply involved mental models that frame how you define your own existence and how you define your relationships with others, right? So if you are, if you live in a, a free market democracy, you define your relationship and your role in society probably a lot different than someone who lives in, you know, some big authoritarian, totalitarian type system. Uh, if you def you know, if you say you are a Christian, you probably define yourself much differently, or at least in some ways differently than someone who is Hindu, right? In a lot of ways the same, but in a lot of ways many different different ways. Uh, now the key thing about these things is they can often pull against each other, right? Um, I think I, I, I think an example I used in the writing was this notion of you know uh, you know the whole Christian thing, you know, thou shalt not kill pretty clear about that. And a lot of things are ambiguous in that book. That one's pretty straightforward. Thou shalt not kill. Uh, although there's a lot of killing that happens that seems sanctioned in that book. Well, when you get to, you know, you're a citizen of a government, uh, you have responsibilities, right? And, and so, you know, we're in wartime, uh, you know, we're in Vietnam and the government says we're doing a draft and you got to go over there and you got to kill people. Well, now you have this conflict. You have this conflict between the mental models that exist in religion and the ones that exist in your government. And a compromise is going to have to be made somewhere. And those compromises are generally very identity defining. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, with your your mental models, you're you're discussing here. Uh, you know, we've well, we that's actually a lost episode. We talked about risk management one time. Me and Mister Betcher, uh, you know, distribution and the bell curve. What are the chances of things you know happening the way they are versus you know. Um, you know, quantitative versus qualitative, your, your distribution, your bell curve there, um, you know, seems to, we, we kind of use all these together, right? The scientific method, if X equals Y, then, you know, we continue on. So if you have an 80% chance of X equaling Y versus 15% of X equaling Y, you're going to have a different, you know, flow or method or, or, or step to go through to get back to why in, in this case. So I can, I can definitely, you know, I can definitely see how all these things work together. Cause if you, you know, um, your operant conditioning, you're going to get a bad response from your boss. If X and Y don't equal at least 80% or something like that. So, um, you know, each one of those are, you, you can implement all of those mental models at, at any time during your day or your work period. Yeah, absolutely. When I was thinking of operate conditioning, I, I, the, the first thing that came to mind was like um, uh, end user training, like security awareness training. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. One of the conversations I have a lot around just conditioning in general, whether operant or classical, is this notion of reward, right? Because people will often ask, should I reward users if they you know, report a fish that they got? Um, and a lot of people handle that different ways. The research generally tells us that you should use variable reward. So you shouldn't reward someone every time they do it. Um, because one, they just will eventually get tired of it and not repeat the behavior, but also because uh, they will come to expect it and may game the system or something like that. So with variable reward, you do it periodically. So maybe once a month, you pick someone, or, you know, a few people at random and do it that way. So people keep thinking there's a chance and to some degree that motivates them to continue to exhibit the behavior that you want. So there are lessons to be learned. Uh, and that's kind of one of those like psychology 101 type things you would learn in a class like that. Um, which we don't, we don't think about enough, but it gives us a mental model that we can apply to tactical, um, tangible things that we're doing. And security awareness is a great example. Yeah, you mentioned getting a reward every time you do something. I'm, I'm automatically thinking of bug bounty programs. You know, and people spamming bug bounty programs because they know they're going to get, you know, hundred, two hundred dollars here for finding cross-site scripting or whatever. And, you know, if they, if they don't get the reward, then they get mad. Um, mm -hmm. you know, or if they, if they keep finding all this, you hear about, you know, bug finders, oh, I've got $150,000 in bug bounties last year. Um, if they didn't get a reward every time, would they continue doing that? Would it be cost effective for them or would they move on? So the, the way we're discussing operant, you know, operant conditioning and bug bounties, you almost have to reward them or you'll get less benefit from the bug bounty program. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think that that type of variable reward would apply well to to bug bounty. And again, we talk about like mental models pulling against each other. If I live in a capitalist society, I believe that I should work and I should get paid for it, mm. and that should be like a non negotiable thing. So if all of a sudden I do work and I don't get paid for it, well, now I'm having to make a compromise. And what the compromise I'll probably make is I'm just not going to participate in that bug bounty anymore. Right. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So scientific method. Yeah. Each one of these models simplifies something complex in a way. So yeah, you were talking about these models, uh, simplifying things that, that make everything useful for, um, practitioners and educators. Uh, does, do these work well for overly complex types of, you know, data sets or, or, or decisions? And are there a point where they fail? Yeah, they can. I, you know, the analogy I like to use a lot of the time is this notion of you're driving down a country road and it's very simple, just kind of slow traffic. You're moving along and you want to understand this complex topic. And that's the freeway, right? Lots of fast moving cars. You're having to navigate traffic, higher speeds. Uh, the mental model is essentially the on ramp that connects you from this country road to the freeway. I mentioned this part of this thing about building new knowledge on top of old knowledge and connecting this. The mental model helps you do that in that way. So, there are certainly mental models that help us understand very complex things. Um, in the article, I talk about how medical professionals have all these mental models they use for various things. Um, some of them are stupid, simple, and some of them are really complicated. Um, I'll give you a simple one is when doctors are dealing with, uh, with bleeding, they have a simple thing. They say it's all bleeding eventually stops. Think about that I for mean, a minute. They're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. 
And so they have that for you. And that sounds kind of weird, but that is something they really like they repeat to themselves. And they've trained themselves almost to repeat it. A lot of emergency physicians will kind of think about this because they know that one, it puts a sense of urgency in what they're doing because they don't want it to stop in the way that you don't want it to stop. If you know what I'm saying here, like, uh, but they also know that there are also a lot of natural things that will cause bleeding to stop, right? Like clotting and stuff like that. So it also, depending on the situation, can give them a sense of like calm, let's wait, let's see what's going on here. Um, make them more slow and deliberate about their environment. So it helps them almost assess the situation better by considering that super simple mental model. Now, some of them, some of those mental models are a lot more complex. Um, the human body is incredibly complex. Um, and, you know, they're in a state where you can't just be a doctor, right? You can't be a doctor who does everything. You can't operate on brains and then treat people for the flu, right? Those are different, different doctors. So one of the mental models I talk about in the, the article is this notion of the 13 organ systems. And depending on what you read, some folks will classify that as 11, 13, or 14. But we have these different groups of organ systems. And what that is, is it's defining to some degree the specialties of doctors. So you may have a cardiac doctor versus a neuro doctor, versus a skeletal doctor. Um, it defines kind of the boundaries of individual systems. And that definition, that boundary system in and of itself is a mental model. We have that in InfoSec to some degree. We don't define it so cleanly, but we have the notion of malware analyst versus uh, incident responder versus security architect to some degree. Some places are better defined than others. Like most all of us know what a malware analyst does. Um, not all of us would know what a security architect necessarily does because that's a little bit more loosely defined. Uh, so we're, we're not, our model is not quite as good as theirs, but we do have these models that, you know, in medicine and these other fields that do a really good job of simplifying complex things. Right. Yeah, you you um, you have three models that you you call out in the in the blog post: defense in depth, the OSI model, the investigation process. Um, one of these is very rigid. The OSI model being fairly rigid, I would imagine. In some cases, the defense in depth is a bit more free form, uh, as well as the investigation process. Um, uh, you know, there it's a little less rigid, but yeah, the defense in depth stuff is a bit more free form. So. Um, it seems like the the ones that you mentioned for the medical stuff is is a bit more um, uh, rigid. I mean, you're going to have four vital signs. It's going to be the same four vital signs across all humans, all living things across the uh, the world. Um, I have a point here, uh, but no, I, mean, I, I get what you're saying here. I mean, it's. I think the question is like, how do we get to more rigid ones? Because they're probably more helpful if they're more rigid. And right. I think that's true in some cases. And there was, I mean, the OSI model is pretty rigid. It's a little less rigid now than it used to be. Um, it could probably be tweaked. We have the TCP IP model, which is kind of like a, a differing version of the OSI model. So mm -hmm. um, models have to evolve. I think that's a key thing as our understanding involves. Uh, one of the things we have working against this on the computing side is, is if you imagine, if you compare the computer to the body, um, you know, humans evolve really, really slowly. Computers evolve incredibly fast. So uh, even if we made a model that describes things in a computer, um, it would maybe change in some ways, um, not in others, but in some. So um, I do think we don't have as many rigid models because what we do is less discrete science and more human-based engineering that just changes so rapidly. So do models beget frameworks or do groups of models beget frameworks? Um, eh. Uh, it depends on how you define a framework, I guess. A lot of folks might say that a model is a framework. Um, the investigation process, which is, is my model, I'm the one who wrote about that originally. A lot of folks would call it a framework for doing the investigation. Um, to some people, a framework is just a model that's um, actionable, I guess, um, that actually has discrete steps tied to it. Um, so it kind of depends on how you define it to some degree. But if you're looking for something that does indeed give you steps, many models will do that. Defense in depth isn't a model that gives you discrete steps. Uh, the investigation process is um, the whole pie curl um, incident response model. So preparation, identification, uh, response, eradication, all that stuff. That is a step by step model. Mm -hmm. um, so we have those and those could at that point be considered frameworks. Right. Okay. Um, and I will say one of the ways we talk about this notion of inductive reasoning. So. If I have a framework, if I realize that, I mean, when we get things like the investigation process, the investigation process isn't because I sat in a room and said, I think this is how people should do investigations. I was very critical about my own process, and I talked to a ton of other investigators. I did kind of a pseudo qualitative research study where I talked to them and I recorded what they were saying and coded the individual responses, did this big meta analysis. And this is kind of the process that revealed itself. So 
people were already doing this. I just kind of structured it, made it pretty and put it on paper so it's more teachable. That's a lot of what models are. And that's a beautiful thing. That's what the scientific method is. We don't have the scientific method because a bunch of old dudes sat around and said, this is how we should do science. They said, this is how we're already doing. This is how scientific discovery already happens. They just structured it, put it on paper, made it accessible and made it teachable. Right. And and for, for I, I've put a link in the show notes to inductive reasoning. According to, to Wikipedia, it's a method of reasoning in which the premises are viewed as supplying some evidence for the truth, which is in contrast to deductive reasoning, where the conclusion of the argument is certain. The truth of the conclusion of an inductive argument may be probable based on. So um, it's interesting because it, it appears that we use both of these to sometimes good or ill. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just I, I guess I need to break out my uh, philosophy and start reading some more on philosophy. But uh, yeah, I mean, we we need to understand the critical thinking, which leads us, you know, doing deductive reasoning. Uh, and, well, and a simple way to, to put this is inductive reasoning is when we examine ourselves and use that to create models. Mm-hmm. Deductive reasoning is when we apply the models we've already created. So that was the end of part one of our discussion with Chris Sanders this week. Uh, <clears throat> before we go, just want to put out a few things. Uh, if you would l- like to join the Break Sex Slack, you can email us at bds.podcast at gmail.com or send a DM on Twitter to at Break Sec, our official podcast Twitter. You can follow uh, Chris Sanders uh, on Twitter at Chris Sanders 88 all one word. And you can follow the hosts of the podcast at Betcher Pwned, B-O-E-T-T-C-H-E-R-P-W-N-E-D. Uh, you can follow uh, Ms. Berlin at InfoSister, I-N-F-O-S-Y-S-T-I-R. And um, she's also doing the Hackers Health nonprofit and Villages for various conferences. So if you're interested in following that Twitter feed, it's at Hackers Health. Uh, Mr. Betcher does the LogMD program, so you can find out about uh, how Windows is not logging data properly. So you can follow that Twitter feed at log underscore md and uh, you can follow me on twitter uh brian break b-r-y-a-n-b-r-a-k-e thank you to our patrons for helping out with the podcast your generous donations uh, help uh with hosting helps pay for the zoom that we're using to record this podcast uh, and helps pay for the time and effort to to get a, a weekly show out which is uh it, it does cost us in time and effort, so we appreciate your help. Uh, if you're not comfortable using Patreon, you can also send us uh, money on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. It's breaksec.com forward slash PayPal BDS. That's capital B, capital D, capital S. We also have a store. If you want to get some T-shirts, uh, you know, breaksec.com slash store. And uh, we'll be back next week, part two of our discussion with Chris Sanders. We'll talk about the Rural Technology Fund, uh, the... Uh, practical packet analysis book and his um, threat hunting class that he's uh, he's doing so uh, and we'll also get into a little bit of discussion on the attack framework so there you go so that was it for breaking down security this week um, just want to tell you to be nice to one another please take care of yourselves because you're the only you you have and we'll talk to you again soon